Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the world's biggest stars. And a man I've admired for many, many years is comedian Sean Hughes. How are you? Good, thank you very much. So then I was last night. I came to see the Railway Children then, and you weren't in it. I know, it's terrible. I, had the, I did the matinee, and then I had a long-standing engagement where I had to uh, fulfil. So uh, back on tonight, if you want to come along. Was it personal? Did you not want to do it because I was there, or did somebody tip you off? Well, I've heard bad things about you, so... Uh, <laughs> You know, it would have made me obviously very nervous if you were in the audience. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about you, because um, I fell in love with you through your comedy, really, on TV, and I suppose you're best known for Buzzcocks, which everybody enjoyed. For me, it's not the same, that show, without you. It's sort of changed, hasn't it? It was very cosy in the old days, because you, you sort of got on with everybody, and um, and it was fun and funny. Well, yeah, like, the producer who started off, he was very much... Uh, of the understanding that it should be kind of a soap opera every week so you kind of know what's going to happen and there's a relationship between the three of us so I guess that's what's probably missing from it now Do you think they care? I mean I suppose it's just moved on and changed has it? Well I don't really watch it because like one of the reasons I left was because I did 10 series and then uh, I kind of realised I was we were doing the same show every week Right to a degree and I was getting to a certain age where you know they tell me who the guests were and I go I don't really know any of these people (laughs) like and it was kind of also like you know like I enjoyed it but it was like it's not what I really wanted on my tombstone you know so because like weirdly when you say people remember me from that they more remember me from uh, Sean's show yeah but you have to be a certain age for that but um but all that's available on the uh, website as well. And I suppose that's your job now, isn't it? To reinvent and keep yourself going. I mean, even during this show, you're still doing your stand-up. And those Edinburgh gigs, I-, I wonder how frustrating they are for a performer. Are they liberating because you've got an audience there who want comedy? Or is it just annoying that you've got to do so many in such a short space of time? Well, Edinburgh's changed so much. Like, Edinburgh, like, because it's a month long. And when I started off, Edinburgh was very much about, you know, you have the basic show there. And you kind of work on it for the month. That's what the whole thing was. And now, uh, because I guess the young comics are more ambitious, they kind of go up with a show that's already ready. Mm. So, you know, they want to review the first night, you know, and that kind of thing. And PR gets involved, and it's all about money and kind of posters and stuff. And it's kind of a bit of the spirit of the fringe is gone now. So I tend to, even when I do do it, I do it for two weeks, because at my age, I can't do a month. I wonder whether comedy was better in your day. I mean, it's so corporate now. When we look at the arenas that they're all doing, taking the money and run, it was about the comedy in your day because there wasn't that much money in it relatively, was there? You weren't making 100 grand a night. Um, You were doing it for the fun of it. And you sort of came up the hard way by learning your craft and developing a show. It's different, like, because my generation didn't do comedy to get on television, but a lot of us ended up on television. So the next generation saw, oh, yeah, you do the clubs and then you get on television. So it's a different kind of ethos, really. Yeah. But um, I have nothing against the, those people doing stadiums, but I just don't see the fun in it, really. Well, it must be interesting. Have you done those charity gigs at the O2 and things where you, you literally can't hear the audience, you can't see them? I guess you just have to do your act at the audience and carry on regardless. Well, it's more, it's more event comedy, that is, where they're just looking at you on the screen. They can't really see you. Yeah. yeah. And like, I think comedy should be pretty intimate. Like That's why... Like you got to admire someone like Stuart Lee who could probably sell out the O2 but instead does a month at Leicester Square or something. Yeah. Weirdly, I'm good mates with uh, Mickey Flanagan and he yeah. really enjoys doing the stadiums and he finds it very similar to doing the clubs but I don't really understand that but that's what he says. Right. I don't get it either. Yeah, it's a completely different beast. I suppose another thing that you did that brought another audience to you, which didn't do you any harm, was Coronation Street. How was that? Well, yeah, again, that was uh, weird because uh, it was something that obviously you grow up with and uh, it was something at last my mother could see and kind of enjoy. Yeah. But um, And the cast, again, they're uh, they're, they're such a kind of family-orientated cast because pretty much like they'll they'll just say to you, um, right, so be on set on Monday at nine o'clock and your first scene's in the Rovers. And that's a very daunting thing to be told. Yeah. And luckily the cast really pull you through all that. Yeah. And they haven't got time to mess around either, have they? They're, I mean, the schedule's oh, relentless. Oh, 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 oh. Incredible. Other things I want to talk about. I mean, you're in the West End, as you like it, with Sienna Miller. I wonder what it's like working with someone like that. Does it sort of overshadow the show and the performance because there's so much attention around her at the stage door? Well, yeah, to a degree. Like, it doesn't really 
really affect the show. But yeah, it is weird when there's paparazzi around at a Shakespeare show. <laughs> but, like she was again very much a team player, like you know. So uh, like I think she they used to try and get her out a different exit and stuff. So that was all a bit weird for yeah. her. But, I guess you'd had experience of that on Buzzcocks because these divas, not that I'm saying she is, but when these divas come into shows like yours and they last for a minute and then they're gone, they can play all those tricks. Do you just rise above it and, and just see it for what it is, which is a load of old nonsense? Well, like, that's the thing. Like, I, I know it's the name of your radio show as well, but I never did any of this to become a celebrity. I just wanted to be good at these things. And, yeah. I, and that's another reason why I've really taken a, a back seat with television because... Uh, it is a real pain in the ass, you know, yeah. recognised all the time. And you can selflessly just leave it at the door. You don't have an ego in that sense. No, no, no. Like, like I guess, like, weird things will happen, like, you know, where, you know, your ego just gets above you like everyone else at times. I remember weirdly doing a, a big stand-up show in York years ago, and uh, it was just as I'd done Coronation Street, and I went for a drink in the bar next door with a friend, and, uh, and there was a lot of attention about it because I was fairly well known at the time. Yeah. And this guy just, you know, in this bar fly just went, well, I've never heard of you. And of course I should have risen above that, but I went, I'm in Coronation Street, the biggest program in the country. <laughs> and I was thinking, why am I even talking to this man? Yeah. It wasn't at the show or anything like you know? yeah. that. It's kind of utmost respect for people who come to see me live as well. Like I'd never take that for granted. Yeah. And even getting to the venue can be a problem. We'll end on this. I know yesterday, before you'd even started any of your gigs, uh, you took a wrong turn and paid the price, I hear. Yeah, I, I'm, oh, I want to I wanna bloody uh, <laughs> sue uh, the sat-nav, because sat-nav said take a right turning. It was in South London, a place I don't really know. I took the right turning, which seemed normal enough at a junction. All of a sudden, the cop car is on top of me. Wow. You know, giving me uh, a really heavy handed as well. Like, you know, don't put your hands in your pockets. Even though one of them recognised me, so I didn't think I was going to knife him. <laughs> but it's, uh, they, yeah, they gave me a £100 fine and uh, three points off my licence. And also, uh, because of cutbacks in the neck, because you know they have to breathalyse you anyway. Yes. And uh, they didn't have a breathalyser with them. And I'm kind of going, look, I have to do this show. And they're going, yeah, we, we've just rang up a, a traffic cop, we'll be here soon. Good so I just Lord. wait with them for 25 minutes. And talking about stuff and, and they seemed quite annoyed that I wasn't uh, drink driving yeah. but it was just that weird thing of having to wait 25 minutes we ended yeah. up talking about that TV programme uh, 24 hours of police custody yes and I was saying how great the cops kind of came yeah. across and that yeah. and like, they were, like two of them were friendly but one of them was very much like and they just wanted to nail me yeah. especially when I was kind of going Look, I'm on stage in 10 minutes. This really isn't kind of very relaxing. <laughs> yes, not what you need before a show. I suppose with the live stand-up, though, you can make it all part of it and you guys make that funny, don't you? I've started off talking about that, but I've given South London £100. <laughs> <laughs> There's your show fee gone. I know, yeah, it was ridiculous. Hey, listen, great to talk to you. Sean Hughes is uh, a fantastic comedian and a wonderful actor too. The Railway Children continues at uh, the King's Cross Theatre. Uh, I was on Platform 2. It was a great show. I loved it, by the way. It's completely different and new. And, of course, the mother load where they come in with the train just before the interval is stunning and deservedly should be at the top of the poster. It is the star of the show, isn't it? Well, it does get a big round of applause at the end when it comes back on. And did you uh, buy a flag and wave it when the train came? Well, I did, and you need to. And i tell you why. This show does take people back to a better time. It's a nostalgia trip from the second the show opens, and it's so unique and beautifully done. They've really thought of everything, haven't they? Well, yeah, like, when I went to see it, um, it is quite a spectacular uh, piece in the sense of, um, you know, the audience are kind of on two sides, actually, in the train station. And uh, it's kind of weird... Uh, like it's very different for me because I'm used to you know having an audience head on and so some of the lines you're doing to just a section of the audience mm. you know did you find yourself having to turn your head quite a lot yeah it reminded me of sort of a Cirque du Soleil where you didn't know where quite to look at the right time and exactly, you picked yeah. up in the end it's amazing it's sort of 3D isn't it yeah very much so yeah and I love the uh, what they do with the tunnel scene as well I think is quite uh, unique it's clever. The whole thing's clever. The way the set moves along the track and they get people on and off under the stage and in the stage and above the stage. It's very, very clever and uh, deservedly should be on at King's Cross. I mean, they started this at Waterloo, didn't they? I think 2010. I think in York. I think the uh, train museum is in, in York and then it came down to Waterloo and now it's at King's Cross. 
Is this a natural fit for you? I mean, I've seen you many, many times over the years in various clubs and on many, many shows. And this, of course, is proper acting. And I know you're great at it. I've seen you in shows before. And it's amazing how you can go from one man with a mic to an ensemble seamlessly. There aren't many can do that. Well, like, the thing is, I'm 49 now. And, um, you know, I've been concentrating on stand-up for the last four or five years solely. Um, and I just thought I wanted to take myself out of my comfort zone. Like... Because basically it was pretty much saying, right, you're going to do this, you're going to do this for months, and you're going to do it with a Yorkshire accent. So it was kind of, uh, it was very hard work. And we only had 10 days rehearsal. And mm. it's a tricky one as well, because uh, the rest of the cast um, have been there since September. So it was only me coming in new. So I felt like the new kid in school as mm. well. So, But I just kind of, I did, I'm on, I'm on my second week now, and I kind of relaxed this week, because I just don't think, show for me as well well it's a health and safety nightmare and when i see you running up and down those stairs i mean you could easily fall off and into the train track and kill yourself couldn't you well thanks for that uh, <laughs> I'm that five when I'm working tonight. just bear me in mind when you're into your second act carrying cases and move trolleys and kind of uh, running all over the shop really but you can't phone this in. I mean, seriously. I mean, there are literally two platforms, and sometimes the stage is there, and sometimes it's not. One wrong foot, and you will literally fall in, won't you? Well, yeah, and it's timed as well. There's a, there's a little section in the show where I have to get on one of the platforms and pick up uh, a post box and stuff like that. And if I don't get my timing right, that that just moves anyway. <laughs> and it did one day, and I was going, well, what's, "What's going on here?" And you're chasing it down the train, are you? Well, it's more like falling, as you say, onto the track and then dying. <laughs> well, at least it'll get you in the papers. We all need publicity. I'd, I'd rather not be in the paper for dying. I'd well, rather just get a good review. All right, nearly dying. Nearly dying is good to be in the papers. Right. You know, when you go into a show like this, and of course you're known as a stand-up, and you're known as a funny man, and you're known as a star, do the other cast sort of go, hmm, can he do it? Do you feel any sort of resistance, or were they behind you? Um, I found them very, very friendly and uh, very warm. They're really, really good group of people, actually. And it could have been like that, you know? And it's that weird thing of, like, again, when I do stand-up shows, <laughs> it's always just me in a dressing room on my own. But I'm sharing a dressing room with, like, uh, eight other actors now. So that's really uh, an odd thing for me. Mm. Are you and getting used to public nudity? Do you find that easy to deal with? Well, I've got psoriasis, so I wear long johns. <laughs> otherwise, I'd scare the hell out of <laughs> Is the chafing okay these days? Oh, God, no, it's not. Because, like, obviously, uh, psoriasis comes on with stress, and the last two weeks have been really stressful. Like, as I say, it's calming down. Now, I say that, but we're Easter coming up. We're doing two shows every day. Yep. And that's a bit of an odd one, because, uh, you know, as I say, you do get a bit tired. And, yep. uh, and then, obviously, you're going, have I said, have we done this scene already? <laughs> and also, it's that weird thing of... Um, you know, the other really um, unique thing about this show is we all go out at the start as ourselves yeah. and talk to the audience. Yeah. And uh, and it's odd because, like, like, to be fair, it is a kids' show prominent, prominently, and uh, and so it's it's interesting playing to kids. And I must say, like, you know, like little things that stay with you. Like, I have to go out in the second half on my own and start sweeping and talk to people yeah. as uh, perks. And I was doing it uh, last week, and this, like, she must have been seven or eight. And it's the best review I've ever had in my life. She just went, I think your acting is beautiful. <laughs> Like little things like that really stay with you. Yeah, the downside to that is, though, you could have somebody from the north who says, I think your acting's a load of crap. Well, yeah, and also the guy who did it beforehand, who was from the north, he came in the other day and he was saying, Sometimes people from Yorkshire go, your Yorkshire accent is rubbish. <laughs> and I'm going, How am I getting away with it? Because also, like, Irish people tend to speak really quickly and Yorkshire people speak very slowly. Yeah. How are you dealing with the multitasking of walking, talking, carrying something, then running, picking, dropping, keeping the accent, talking, walking? I mean, because you never stop, do you, in this role? Yeah, the kind of... Well, see, the other hard thing is uh, when the show starts, like, the preamble is just me in my own accent, and then once they announce that the train's coming, I have to be London. So I'm London for the first three or four minutes because the train is there's them in London going to Yorkshire yeah. and then within minutes I'm into a Yorkshire accent so that took a little bit of getting used to Where do you start with a script? I mean you're given two hours of entertainment and you've got to learn it in ten days what do you start with first? The words and then the movements? I mean because this is a, a really complicated show if you're on the wrong side of the platform you can't just take two steps across you've got to walk all the way around which takes a minute and a half Well like what tends to happen is muscle memory kicks in 
in. So you kind of start getting used to where you're supposed to be and stuff. But like, initially with the script, you can, I went to see the show three times, so I got the general sense of the character. Yeah. And that's how you start. You get the general sense of the character, and then there was a couple of expressions that I was having real trouble with because they just didn't really roll off my tongue. Like, I don't know if you remember from last night, uh, like one of my first lines, which I used to dread, was uh, he has to say, no, it's just that I'm very perspicacious. Yeah. I did, I'd never heard that word before. No. no. So, like, I was saying all sorts of things. I'm very perspicacious, kind of you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, so, like, one thing... But then, like, that's there now. That's in my head. Yeah. But I was dreading that for about three days. And then that's when you trip yourself up, isn't it, when you're overthinking it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, because it's just kind of, uh, like, it's, it's not ever where the show would go down, but it's that thing that sometimes you end up paraphrasing because yeah. it's just kind of, like, it's, you're right in the sense that you really have to concentrate, you know, quite a lot, like, yeah. much more so than any other West End show I've done. Where you know because of so much physicality, yeah. So it's just a lot more concentration involved. And then again, there's no ad lib that you can do in your comedy show. Do you find that restricting, or are you loving the fact that the script will carry you through the show? Well, there's a little bit. There's a, a tiny bit. Like obviously, I can't step on anyone's lines, but um, if there's a moment uh, where I can do an ad lib, I do. I've already put in ad libs. You know, but like you know, within the context of the piece, yeah. and it, it's just like, for instance, there's that lovely scene that I have to do where it's my birthday, and uh, and like all it says in the script, the word when you get the script, there's no directions on it, which is very unusual, and so like I've got six kids in the show, yes. you know, Perks has, and I, I just felt the first week I was going, why am I not saying hello to the kids? I'm going straight in and saying hello, love, to the <laughs> wife. So I kind of found a way to be able to communicate with the kids as well. The audience love that, don't they? Because that's just for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, bizarrely, the other the other night, um, you know the toy train that uh, I fixed for them? Yes. It wasn't there. Right. What do we do then when you open the box? I had to uh, go out and go, hey, I fixed your train. <laughs> <laughs> so and who do you punch backstage? Is there a producer available? Um, well, I've got an associate director who comes in once a week and he looks at us and then they give us notes. <laughs> He's the man ahead of blame. Congratulations on this piece. It is wonderful. It's great that it's at King's Cross. Perfect uh, purpose-built station and the train is magnificent. This piece is nostalgic and it takes you back and I'm sure the kids will love it as much as the adults for very different reasons. It's spectacular. You find a lot of uh, very old people come along as well. Yeah. You know, for those nostalgic reasons. Just to compliment to your sound guys as well, it really was astonishing how good the sound was. Not easy in a sort of purpose-built but not permanent theatre. But bizarrely, like it's a musical without any music. It's just underscored. Yes. Put um, Sean Hughes into Google and it'll come up. And I hope you come to Nottingham and I'll come and see you there. It's been really lovely talking to you. Thanks, Alex. Have a lovely weekend. Cheers, big man. Ta-da. Bye.